Welcome everybody. I'm going to start off with a few memories from 1998, the first year, that the year that we applied for the first CDHA grant. Then, after I talk a little bit about my memories, I'm going to read a uh, document from David Featherman, and uh, who could not be here today. So, right now, I am myself. In a few minutes, I will be a 77-year-old professor emeritus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my memories of the 1998 CHA Center Grant proposal. Let's travel back in time to 1998. That summer, Microsoft had just released <laughs> Windows 98. CD-ROMs were beginning to replace the floppy disk for portable file storage. Apple had just introduced their iMac computer, the first one ever to be shipped without a floppy disk drive. Flip phones and candy bar phones were the ones that were really in style. I think I had that blue one. And on September 4th, 1998, two guys in California incorporated a new startup called Google. Here in Madison, we were cool kids. We were already using the internet and we even had a new World Wide Web page for CDE <laughs> with a link to Gopher for searching the internet. In late, in late 1998, Jeff Peterson and I started putting together a new proposal for Bob Hauser for an aging center grant in response to a request for applications issued by Richard Sussman at NIA with a very short timeline. The RFA calling for proposals on the center, Centers on Demography of Aging was issued in September with a November 20th, 1998 due date. In those days, all NIH proposals were submitted on paper, and back in 1998, Word was supplanting Word Perfect as the most popular word processing software but we were firmly in the Word Perfect camp. Love those revealed codes. <laughs> I still have all the Word Perfect files from the proposal on my PC right downstairs, if anyone wants to see them. And here is the proposal itself. 262 pages of loveliness <laughs> right here. <laughs> All of the original files for this document are dated on my computer, 11-19-1998, which was the deadline by which we needed to send the proposal to Washington, D.C. for the November 20th due date. The table of contents file, the last file in the directory created on that day, is time stamped on my computer at 3.30 p.m. That is cutting it close. <laughs> Each file needed for this proposal was in a separate document and there were no PDFs. The table of contents file was created last because I would not have been able to determine the page numbers for anything in the table of contents until the entire proposal was printed out, numbered, and checked to see that there were no blank pages. Once everything was printed, we would have had to walk a university transmittal form down Bascom Hill and back for actual ink signatures from Bob, the sociology chair, LNS, and RSP. There was no whisper for electronic routing back then. After printing the entire 262-page proposal, plus appendices, Bob always had appendices. <laughs> we then made five single-sided paper copies of the entire thing, packaged the original and all the copies up in a full-size copy paper box to FedEx to Washington for arrival on the morning of the 20th. We then waited fretfully for the FedEx driver to arrive and pick up the box before the end of the day. Jeff and I always prided ourselves that we got proposals in on time, though back then we sometimes seriously considered whether someone could hop on a plane to D.C. in the morning with the proposal in hand and drop the package off at the NIH loading dock. Fun memories. <laughs> Long story short, the proposal did make it to D.C., the NIA funded it, and the rest is history. Congratulations to Bob, the founder, Alberto, Pam Hurd, and Jason, who have continued to provide leadership for CPHA, and here's to 20 more years. Okay, this is uh, the uh, talk that David Featherman would have 
presented. If he were able to be here, he was not able to come, but he did provide these really nice memories of the history of the aging uh, research at the UW. On the 20th anniversary of the Center for Demography of Health and Aging, December 13, 2019, by David L. Featherman, Professor Emeritus, University of Michigan. Let me begin by thanking Jason, Bob, and Alberto for their generous invitation to attend today's celebration. I sincerely regret missing the in-person opportunity to congratulate all whose diligence and vision have fostered the flourishing of the CDHA <coughs> over two decades. Among its sibling national centers, it stands with enviable distinction and notable distinctiveness. Congratulations. Having been asked to contribute some personal recollections about the prehistory of CDHA, let me set the stage with both organizational and intellectual context circa 1980, some 20 years before the formalization of CDHA. Then, as now, the UW-Madison possessed a distinguished faculty in sociology, economics, statistics, and public health gathered into a world-class collaboratory known to all of you as CDE, the Center for Demography and Ecology. While at that time, I don't recall having been a major, aging having been a major research topic of its own, as for instance in the demography of aging, by contrast to age, by contrast, age and sex differentials always were part of classical demographic analyses. As an aside, I do recall a t-shirt once worn by Larry Bumpus with the CDE logo on his chest and on his back the phrase, broken down by age and sex. <laughs> <laughs> to be sure, the institutional infrastructure of CDE, its faculty and trainee intelligence, and its distinctive affiliated longitudinal projects, notably the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, provided a necessary initial condition for the emergence of CDHA. Of course, that is well known by all here today. What may be less well known is another organizational precursor the Faye McBeath Institute on Aging and Adult Life. In the 1970s, the McBeath Institute, administered by the graduate school but housed within the School of Social Work and directed by Martin Loeb of that faculty, was a major campus node for research and training in social gerontology. Perforce, the academic and applied studies of aging under that auspice tended to focus on the so-called problems of the aged, such as poverty, loss within friendship and family <coughs> networks of support, and declines in mental and physical functioning. Faculty associated with the institute were by and large social workers. But a few economist faculty of that school were research scholars of aging as well as the aged, with ties to CDE and or the Poverty Institute, most notably Irv Garfinkel and Sheldon Danziger. In the early 1980s, I became director of that institute with a charge from the graduate school to broaden the scope of its work and of the university's faculties engaged in its research and training. In so doing, as a sociologist member of CDE, the link between two institutional precursors of CDHA was strengthened. Today, of course, Carol Riff is a contemporary link between CDHA and the former McBeath Institute, of which she is the director. Shortly after I became McBeath director, the university approved renaming it as the Institute on Aging. No objection came from the Faye McBeath Foundation, which apparently had not made a naming gift and which had provided no continuing grant support. Hereafter, I refer to it as the Institute. So let me now shift to the intellectual context with a brief account of how rather serendipitously I became a student of aging. During 1978-79, I spent a sabbatical year at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences in Palo Alto. Bob Hauser and I had just sent off our manuscript, Opportunity and Change, summarizing our study of intergenerational social mobility in 1962 and 1973. I was contemplating a new focus within the Dudley Duncan genre of stratification research, which Dudley labeled the socioeconomic life cycle. As it happened, the center had created a special seminar of re resident fellows that year to explore and e develop an interdisciplinary field of aging that incorporated biogenetic, socioeconomic, psychosocial, historical, and policy facets, among others. Common terms of today, like 
<clears throat> life course and successful aging were then still embryonic. Development meant growth, something that children underwent, while aging meant decline and loss, not something that typically described change in children. The interplay of gains and losses as dual processes over the entire lifespan, birth to death, had yet to be widely appreciated. I was invited to, into that seminar shortly after it commenced. Its major organizers included sociologist Matilda White Riley, who would become the first associate director of the Institute on Aging, Institute of Aging within NIH for Social and Behavioral <coughs> Sciences, psychologists Mavis Hetherington and Paul B. and Margaret Baltus. He would later become director of the Max Planck Institute on Development and Education in Berlin. Economist Jim Heckman, later a Nobel laureate, and Victor Fuchs and geriatrician James Fries. As a result of that seminar, I wrote at the request of the National Science Foundation for its Frontiers of Science series, a synthetic intellectual history of an emergent lifespan perspective <coughs> with diverse roots within various behavioral and social sciences. Among many, dem demography or population studies comprised one route extending from Europe. Another, at least as major, European developmental psychology also could be traced into the 19th century. At the time I published the essay, the contributing disciplines were just beginning to influence each other in ways <clears throat> that might presage a more consolidated field of scholarship. But that lay in the future, and one could argue that it still does. Back in Madison, the grateful beneficiary of what the Center at Palo Alto does best, I was eager to foster similar conversations and potential collaborations around aging across campus. Revisioning the mission of the former McBeath Institute became a second career career-changing influence of the 1980s. Campus colleagues' then ongoing research should not be attributed to the Institute, but advisors and consultants such as Bill Sewell, Bob and Tess Hauser, Larry Bumpus, James Sweet, Sheldon Danziger, and Carol Riff were indispensable to stimulating additional faculty interest and graduate students to the field. Another intellectual resource for the Institute's development came from a national multidisciplinary research network on successful aging, assembled in 1985 by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. It ran for more than a decade. That network benefited from the earlier Palo Alto seminar, both from its pioneering conceptual exploration and from overlapping participants, especially Paul Baltus and to a lesser degree myself. Importantly, the MacArthur Network advanced the consolidation of a lifespan perspective, at least as applied to aging, and its several interdisciplinary empirical projects demonstrated how field and experimental studies conducted by multidisciplinary teams create new insights about potential gains as well as losses after midlife. Through additional conceptually driven <coughs> research such as the networks, the former euphemism successful aging came to enjoy an empirical basis. A subsequent offshoot of that network focused on successful midlife development, the ongoing Midas Midlife in the U.S. survey led by Carol Riff is a major outcome of that second MacArthur funded effort. In Madison, a few early achievements attributable to the Institute's influence gave concrete additional life to multidisciplinary work on aging. Among the first programs of projects awarded by Matilda Riley's fledgling, fledgling office at NIA in 1985 were five cross-campus projects bundled under the title Individual Aging and Institutional Bases of the Life Course. The following year, we were awarded an NIA training grant, Population, Life Course, and Aging. The latter tied neatly into the CDE training grant, as by Title I would hope, Pre- and postdoc trainees in the two met together in weekly seminars. In connection with that program, I created an undergraduate course, SOCH 575, and a graduate seminar on the sociology of the life course and aging. In roughly the same time frame, the Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences, Dr. David Kindig, and I 
collaborated in writing a successful pitch to the state for funding five new faculty positions in aging, mostly in the medical and biological sciences, with intentional links to the institute. If truth be told, however, what had been achieved was still more like parallel play than consolidated team effort. For example, our initial program of five projects ultimately did not yield as much cross-fertilization as we had hoped and promised, and our renewal proposal was not approved. I accept considerable responsibility for that failure, but at the same time, it provided an early lesson for the Young Institute about the difficulty of creating novel, programmatic, synthetic research from ongoing projects with their own already considerable goals and momentum. <clears throat> that said, by the time I left Wisconsin for the Social Science Research Council in 1989, many influences from many sources, both on and off campus, were galvanizing <laughs> new conceptual, empirical, and clinical work on aging as a lifelong progress akin to development. Work in geriatrics and social gerontology continued, but now within a broader conceptual and empirical space. What made Madison a pivotal player in this wider realization was no single person or campus niche, but clearly the abundant infrastructure and faculty creativity within CDE, and to some extent affiliated with the Institute's outreach, we were highly productive incubators. Indirectly, at least, I should think, Today's CDHA could see this prehistory as part of, of a 40-year-old legacy. I should conclude with a cautionary apology. I view most histories as revisionist narratives to some degree, each including or excluding, emphasizing or de-emphasizing, or simply overlooking or forgetting as is human nature. In a 77-year-old like me, the latter is the unavoidable stuff of time, or shall I say, aging. Once again, congratulations one and all, well done, and best wishes for many years to follow. <laughs>